Well, uh, my name is uh, Jeroen Veenendaal. I have the honor to have uh, worked here for Erasmus Medical Center. I'm now an uh, independent uh, procurement consultant. And I've been doing procurement for 15 years. I only work for uh, public entities, so I just love European tendering. Um, and to be honest, I'm, uh, I usually don't get a lot of time to explain the, the project that we've done. I usually have to do it in 10 minutes. Um, so I have maybe a half an hour, maybe even longer. I also like to have a discussion, so please, if you have any questions, just don't hesitate to uh, stick up your hand. Uh, but uh, before I'm going to uh, explain something about the project, um, I first want to share some insights on innovation, the procurement, and the fact that there's a push, a traditional push market, and uh, that we've pretty much reversed the, 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 the order of doing things. Because for me personally, that was an insight that I really like to share. Uh, so it's a bit of an experiment to see if it works. So if you can give me any feedback afterwards, that would be very nice. Um, so, um, these are all in Dutch, I'm very sorry, but it does explain something that I, I see so, um, in Europe uh, broadly, that um, in Holland we have a lot of money going through um, uh, research and development, just give the money away as a, as a subsidy. Um, and that's, the, the figure is about 6 billion a year, and that's a figure you have to keep in mind. But it's 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 becoming less. You know, we have to we have budget costs. So they think in 2019 it's five and a half billion euros, and that's money spent on subsidies for research and development. And it usually goes to big companies, but there's also a small portion available for SMEs. Um, and why did we do that? Actually, well, um, that's because uh, we think that uh, innovation is good for the economy, right? I mean, we need the innovation to, uh, as our uh, undersecretary, Mr. Decker, says, uh, we need to have knowledge uh, transformed into a practical application so it actually adds value to our economy and creates jobs. So, you know, uh, there's a government uh, understanding and we all feel that innovation is very necessary for our economy. Um, that's why it's weird that we are going to reduce the investments that we do in research and development. But for me personally, uh, I think there's a lot, there's a big opportunity if you look at the budget that we have for public procurement. Um, there's, um, there's a figure that 2.5% of our total budget, only for Holland, on the public procurement, if you spend 2.5% on the procurement of innovation, that's 1.6 billion euros. So, in fact, uh, those 2.5% total procurement budget is about 30% of the total budget we spend on research and development. So I think there's a huge potential to be explored with the procurement of innovation. And um, that's because then the, the knife cuts on two sides. I don't know if that's a proper English saying, but we have it. So um, that brings me into an uh, interesting discussion about research and development and innovation. And, I, and this is an old sheet. Um, um, I, I've, I've come across uh, Mr. Frost, actually, I've seen it six years ago, it's still valid. Um, and I don't want to have a discussion on what is innovation or what is research, because it's pretty stupid, actually, I think it's, 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 it's not necessary. Uh, but I do know that, uh, and uh, Eva said it very, very clearly, innovation is about using things for a new purpose. And, and so innovation, if it, for me, that's, that's the, the definition of innovation. Getting smart ideas, putting it in a new environment and get, get, um, uh, and get solutions like the bed washing facility. Um, so um, what is that new purpose? How do we define a new purpose? Uh, and if you can see that from a marketplace, uh, there are a lot of ideas from the marketplace. So, um, that says, you know, I've got a new purpose, would you buy this from me? So that's a traditional push. And there's an interesting um, uh, thought on that, but uh, before I get into that, um, I want to share something <laughs> of my colleagues, uh, of my fellow procurement uh, professionals, um, and, uh, and, and to defend them even a little bit, uh, because usually procurement professionals are an obstruction for innovation and that's because they're being taught to reduce risk to reduce it to absolute zero to make absolutely sure that what they're going to buy is going to provide a solution and as Eva demonstrated 
there is no way innovative procurement is riskless. There are going to be projects that are going to fail. Um, but I really strongly believe that if we're going to keep doing what we're doing, it's not going to be, um, we're not going to provide solutions quickly enough. We will fail uh, on the long run. Um, so for me, it's really about how we're going to buy them. And this is a very good case sample um, uh, of how we can do it. Uh, after lunch, I have another one with the city council here, and I hope to inspire you with that. Um, um, and I don't think there's like a way to do this. I think it's, it's always custom. Uh, so we can have a discussion on several points on that. So um, talking about procurement and risk-free procurement, I don't actually believe that that's the case. Um, this is in Dutch, um, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's a very nice news message. It says that Siemens, before, uh, Siemens is going to supply the Lassen Medical Center here with the electronic patient system. Whole new system, um, and that's uh, March 2014. And uh, hey, what do you know? A year, a year later, they say, we're going to stop this. We're going to stop the contract. So they've bought the, the, the system through a normal procurement procedure and still it stops. The damage of this project was about 10 million euros just for Erasmus Medical Center. So I don't actually believe that a traditional procurement will provide you with less risk. Um, I've got another example of this. Um, are there any Dutch people here? Yes, okay. Um, I don't know if you heard anything about it, but we have a big argument with an Italian uh, uh, train uh, builder um, about the high-speed train uh, that we've bought. Um, and we actually had a, a, a parliamentary inquiry about it. So this was quite a big deal. Um, and a lot of people lost their job, I, 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 I presume. But there's a quote in this of the senior procurement officer of the uh, Dutch railways. And he says, uh, a contract that gets you to the finish line after European ton tender is a good contract. Well, <coughs> that might be the case, but it did cost us 11 billion euros. A traditional procurement that end up in disaster. So I don't actually believe that traditional procurement is going to reduce risk. So uh, if we bear that in mind, um, why do suppliers then uh, want to invest in, um, in innovation? I mean, we just uh, heard Eva said that it, it's going to cost him a lot of money. But uh, the, 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 there's, a, there's a big pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that is new customers, new turnover. And I strongly believe that they're going to sell this quite shortly uh, because this is a solution that you really want to buy if you can buy it, of course. Um, and I, uh, uh, this is also a sheet that I've uh, copy-paste from uh, Mr. Frost, who is a <coughs> chief engineer in uh, new uh, product uh, development with, uh, where, where is he working? Johnson Matthew. Uh, Johnson Matthew, who supplies yeah, fuel he's cells, he's right? He's the technical strategic director of Johnson Matthew. Yeah, and they provide fuel cells, so they're pretty much in this type fuel of business. Fuel cells and catalysts and yeah. oil and gas. Kind of so so that's, that's all new innovative, innovative stuff. And he said, you know, I, I, what I'm not sure of is that if I'm going to provide a solution, am I going to sell it? And we have a great new invention that's called Kickstarter, who's trying to close that gap. That's also a push. You know, it's, it's, it says, I've got a great idea. Who wants to invest in me so I can make you the product? Does anybody ever got something from Kickstarter? You have to wait for months. It's like a great anticipation. Uh, and I've got a, a, a great, uh, um, oh, before I get into the example, I first want to share you something about product development. And I'm not a product developer, so if there are any product developers here who, sets, who's, who knows I'm doing something wrong, sorry. Um, so if you look at the, at the particular product development stage or product development process, it starts with this little, it says needs here. And that triggered me. You know, I, if I want to do innovative procurement, I have to think about my needs. If you look at product development, they're thinking about needs as well. So it's pretty interesting. And they have this whole process of being conceived solutions and, 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 and uh, um, user and marketing testing. And of course, the last stage, that's the easy one, ensure accurate implementation. <laughs> well, that's not really true, is it? Because um, there, you, can, you can almost 
put a process behind beneath it. That's called the value of death, and that's that's a well-known economical model. Um, that there is, especially when the product gets further uh, mature, it, it gets more risk because then then there's a lot of money in it. Um, and I believe that Kickstarter, but also the procurement of innovation, are models that try to reduce the risk of the value of death. So. This is my process. I love this process, but there's something strange about it. This project starts with needs as well. And a particular procurement process, if you do market sounding, for example, it's always placed after those uh, accurate implementation. So it's always with successful products, that's what you see when you have a market consultation. You never ever, in a market consultation, um, talk to uh, uh, a machine builder saying, you know, Mm, yeah, there are suppliers with this project, and uh, of, uh, there are suppliers of a uh, washing facility, but can you make one, please? You don't do that, right? They don't come across you. I'll go back to this picture later. There's a big uh, paradox in this. So, um, I want to give you a small example of, uh, I don't know if you heard this, Exploding Kittens, have anybody heard of it? No, it's, uh, it's you know, we're just before lunch, it's a movie, so that's great. Please work. Hi there, my name is Matthew Inman, I make the oatmeal, and this is Elon Lee and Shane Small. They make really cool games. The three of us got together and created a new card game called Exploding Kittens. Here's how the game works. You set our deck of cards face down and take turns drawing until one of you draws the Exploding Kitten card. Whoever draws the Exploding Kitten card explodes, they are dead, and they are out of the game. Unless that player has a diffuse card, which can diffuse the kittens using things like laser pointers, kitten therapy, and catnip sandwiches. In addition, there are various action cards which can be used to move, mitigate, or avoid the kittens throughout the game, such as skipping your turn by wearing a portable cheetah butt, attacking other players by deploying the thousand in your back hair, picking a card from the drop pile by rubbing the belly of a pigacorn, or seeking out the wisdom of an all-seeing goat wizard. You can also deploy the Taco Cat, Apricot Crab Lincoln, Magical Meat Bikinis, and a fearsome Caterwaki. To win this highly strategic, kitty-powered version of Russian Roulette, you have to decide which cards to play, when to play them, and which of your opponents to target. The gameplay allows you to develop fun or cruel strategies against one another. The game is kid-friendly, super fun, and super easy to learn. But that doesn't mean exploding kittens is simple. With every card you draw, you increase your chances of getting one of the exploding kittens and being booted from the game. The longer you play, the greater your odds of exploding, and the more tense the game gets. So, if you're the type of person who's into games, kittens, laser beams, sasquatches, explosions, enchiladas, and sometimes goats, please, try our game. Thank you very much. <laughs> So who wants to buy this game? That's how it works, right? I mean, it, it tries to uh, give the idea um, uh, and tries to sell it before it's actually made. So um, um, the funny fact of this is this is the most backed project of all time on Kickstarter. About 280,000 people backed this project. Um, so this is very successful. And this is a great example of a push that's really outrageous, to be honest. I mean, look at the picture. Uh, but they still were managed to get people enthusiastic and sell the product. Um, I want to do the same thing, but then with procurement. So I'm doing it the other way around. So I'm saying uh, I want to make suppliers think I need to really supply this solution for this organization. So for me, that's the key part of the procurement of innovation. Um, does it always work? No. 10% of all projects that are being backed and are being successful do not get to the point of delivery. So also here, even though there's money, there's infrastructure, there's a good idea, there are customers, 10% fails. So for me, that was a lesson learned in the backwashing facility project as well. Um, as a procurer, in an innovative procurement, you cannot lay, uh, get a layback uh, attitude and just um, think, you know, you are the supplier, make it for me. You really have to collaborate to reduce the 9% to a 0%. You really have to collaborate together. So, um, putting it into pictures, because I really like pictures, uh, my strategy is if you want to do a procurement of innovation, you have to think about the integration of product development and a procurement process. And for me, that solution is forward procurement. 
and I can tell you all of, about it, but that's a bit boring. Uh, Gainer can tell you even more about it, uh, but it's really great. I think it's a really great solution. So, uh, more successful innovation through procurement. Um, I think it's really into the second bullet, right? It, it really is about specifying future unmet needs. Uh, but I also think that it's about uh, a credible demand. And I want to make a small remark about the um, uh, PCP kind of projects, which are pre-commercial. That's all fun and games, but it's, not, it's, it's maybe a genuine demand. I mean, you can supply an unmet need that's really genuine to you. But are you really going to buy that solution? For me, that's a uh, very, yeah, I don't really believe in pre-commercial procurement. I really believe in not only a, a genuine, but also a credible demand. If you're going to put money into a project and you want to buy the best solution, you really have to put through with investing in the money. And then even we did just buy that solution that's downstairs. But it's nowhere near the amount of cost that has to be made. All right, so, uh, and support supplies and the need for information. It's really about focusing in another way on the procurement process. It's about, you know, it's about uh, rejecting the fact that there is a market. What is a market? You know, when is something a market? Is that the suppliers who supply the solutions right now? Is it really? And how broad is it then? And why not some other type of company? Because IMS Medical, um, <laughs> didn't have anything to do with the Rasmus Medical Center. So, you know, it's really about communicating those unmet needs, and that's something you have to do in an innovative way in itself. We'll come back to that later. So, um, I've put this in, just so you know, there's, a, there's been put another thought into formal commitment procurement, and I'm not gonna get into it. It's really, if you get the sheets at home, it's nice to read. Uh, that's also for this sheet. So, uh, let's talk about the project itself. Um, and I, uh, I call it the winning effect of being a lunch customer. <coughs> and, and, and Eva had a bit of a... Um, it, it has been a harsh time. Luckily, I didn't work for Erasmus Medical Center anymore. That's something I shoved in the shoes of Maarten. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, and I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I can say something about the project itself, but um, this is not about about me, this is about the Erasmus Medical Center being a very good customer. It's about Rinus de Viet, it's about Martin, it's about all the people uh, that, that worked and collaborated together with the supplier and made it happen. So sometimes I feel a little bit awkward saying, saying or presenting the project, um, but I really want to stress that it's, um, <coughs> it, it's been a success because of a lot of people and maybe even a little bit of luck. So, um, This outline was somewhere in 2010, 2011, we had those unmet needs identified. Um, and uh, Eva said to me that the, uh, the, the, the costs there are for the two sheets, not the per sheet. Um, um, but we just looked at it from a point of view. We have about a million euros spent to spend on this project. We knew we were going to buy this existing solution that was pretty much the amount of money you would have to put into it. Uh, but we also had a problem with one supplier uh, that was capable of supplying the solution, and they even sent us a letter saying, no, we're not really sure if you're going to buy it, but if you're going to build a new hospital, that we're going to provide the solution because we're thinking about stopping it. So we had a huge urgency to get the project out um, and trying to get more suppliers in. Um, so, um, it took us a long uh, day to uh, use the competitive dialogue procedure um, uh, to answer the, the question you just said. Um, and that took, so, took a long time. But I really want to stress out that um, we did a market engagement phase and that supplied us with 63 suppliers who said, no, I can identify this comment needs. I might be able to do the solution. So we have one actual supplier and 63 potential suppliers saying, no, I might be able to help you out with this. So that's what I mean with what is a market. So um, how do you get those 63 suppliers uh, with no budget for communication? It's really about using um, 
It's, it's about using smart communication solutions. It's about involving your own press department. It's trying to get people uh, who love the procurement processes, to get them enthusiastic and Twitter about it. It's really about making a snowball, actually, and rolling it down the mountain. Um, we were probably a little bit lucky. We even got to the national press in the newspapers. That helps. You know, people read that and they go, hmm, wait a minute, this might be interesting. Why not uh, pay a visit to the uh, market uh, meeting day? And uh, these are those 63 suppliers that actually turned up. And what we really do, did is we tried to let them communicate with each other uh, to see what type of solution, no, not what type of solution, what type of company they are, and to see how they can collaborate. Really try to uh, motivate them to uh, make combinations. So, um, that was the interesting part. This is going to be a little bit more boring, so try to stay with me. Um, but I do think there are, um, this gives us a, a rough outline of the types of demands we've uh, implemented to adjust if suppliers were good enough <coughs> to supply us with a solution. And we were a bit of in a struggle because we really want to incorporate the SMEs. Uh, but we couldn't ask for a reference saying, you know, what have you done on cleaning beds before? Because then we didn't get any innovation. So we were a bit of a struggle and we ended up with a very low standard as a demand. And uh, we had a lot of discussions uh, uh, debating on whether or not that was sufficient. Because truth be told, we did end up with a supplier who might bit of a little bit more than he could chew. Uh, but then again, if we did not if we put up, uh, put up higher specifications or higher demands, uh, we might not have encountered IMS. So, um, you know, if you have any thoughts on that, <laughs> please let me know because it's really, uh, it's really, it's really difficult to be honest. Um, so we had one supplier at the first, but at the end of the process, we had um, eight parties who were selected for participating in the competitive dialogue, and the current supplier wasn't one of them. That was quite interesting. So, um, and then we ended up in the dialogue phase. And we just, we just keep the documents as, as, as light as possible. It just communicated those unmet needs. You know, we are not going to supply a solution. You have to do it for us and we're going to help you develop your product during the dialogue. And luckily, uh, Joram Nauta is going to explain the TCO and the CO2 calculation methods. It's very interesting and I think it's a very critical part in the process, um, uh, which <coughs> was, for, from a procurement part of, point of view, it was good because we could um, measure the competitors um, with each other. But for the, for the participants itself, it was good as well because they now had a benchmark saying, you know, this is our CO2 <coughs> number now. Can we do something in the development of the the, the, the conceptual idea to reduce it. Um, you see reduction from three to uh, two suppliers over there? Uh, yeah, I just said eight, right? Um, five of them were uh, parties who washed the beds by hand. And I know there's a very uh, good collaboration with the microbiologist, the, the chief of uh, microbiology here right now. Uh, that wasn't the case then. Uh, she just said, I don't want any hand washing, just remove it. And we had a discussion saying, you know, why do you want this? I, uh, do you have any evidence saying that it's worse than that it is cleaning by machine? And uh, we didn't find any solution to the problem. And I even don't think there's a... Well, I had a small slide about it because it's a... They wanted, uh, and it's not just uh, a discussion within the Erasmus, but it's also a discussion yeah. nationally. And there were some new national guidelines that say now that mechanical washing is preferred because it's uh, uh, it can be um, uh, what is it? Valid, validated. Validated. That was yeah. the main the main issue. Yeah. It can be validated and reproduced afterwards. So if you have an infection outbreak, you can at least say what have you done to control. it. So uh, I lost the discussion, obviously. So we had three left, and uh, we actually uh, ended up with two suppliers because one of them was in a dial. It, it, it was kind of obvious that they weren't, weren't able to uh, supply a solution that's going to be feasible. 
it actually was uh, washing bed in a way that you wash your car. <laughs> it, it, roughly. Um, so, um, this is one sheet, but it was about five years of my life, to be honest, uh, because um, uh, when you end the dialogue, you end the dialogue when you say, I think we have discussed pretty much all the ins and outs that we need to uh, draw up a normal tender document. Uh, and the final offer phase pretty much is like a normal standard European tender procedure. It's a little bit shorter maybe, but it, it has a lot of uh, similar um, characteristics. Uh, and one supplier ended up saying, uh, I want 100% full up front, uh, and if you're not going to do it, we're not going to provide the solution. So the risk that we have identified with money and uh, grants that are uh, available for it is, is real and it ended up uh, for me that phase to be honest just within this room I thought this you know this 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 supplier just really don't want to supply the solution you know they really took a reason saying I know you're not going to do this because it's you know it's it's taxpayers money so we're gonna throw money in a pit um, so you know it, it ended up with uh, just uh, one uh, supplier uh, which was good because it was the best solution anyway. Um, so we draw up a business case, we did it uh, together with uh, TNO as well, and we said, you know, look at this CO2 reduction. And that was quite, um, how can I say this politically correct? Um, well, I was a bit disappointed that CO2 reduction in the business case situation has no value. So sometimes we, ju we just say, you know, CO2 reduction is very important and we put it on the, on the outside of our building, but when it comes to the money, it's no validate, it's no valid argument uh, or a point in the business case. Uh, luckily, uh, the business case is pretty solid. Um, and it took up about a year to get from the decision that IMS is going to get the contract until the contract was signed, it was about a year. So we had a year of internal discussion. So yes, the project was late, but it also has something to do with the internal procedures of the Erasmus Medical Center itself as well. Um, and it's mainly based around the risk. Are we going to buy something that doesn't even exist? Yes. Yeah. All right, almost finished. Um, so results, right? Uh, that's always nice to present. Um, and the results that, that are being achieved by, uh, by the VMARC are very impressive on itself. Um, um, and, and also the unintended uh, project results as the discussion about how clean is it bad, that's, that's really great. Uh, but I also want to, want to um, address where I started with is that for the Erasmus Medical Center, there's an extra catch. I mean, we had a lot of news exposure. It, it emphasizes on the, on the fact that we're an innovative hospital. Uh, and that's through procurement. I mean, as a procurement officer, you're always trying to help the core of your organization achieve that goal. And innovation on itself is a goal for us as a medical center. Uh, and of course, it's cleaner, cheaper, and better, uh, but also for the, for the economy of the European Union, and also for Holland. We have a new export product you're going to? Well, I'm speaking with a country in Dubai. Yeah. So it's in that region. <laughs> so yes, that's good for the EU, right? Uh, and it also creates more jobs. I mean, uh, the job uh, of EFA didn't exist before the standard. So that's, you know, EFA is, is the example that it actually works that way. So, uh, you know, th these are uh, results that might not work when you try to persuade your board of directors of doing these types of projects, but they are going to be results like this. So this is also something you can take home and uh, uh, read for yourself. Uh, um, you know, um, I do think we were lucky, um, to be honest. I do think that in this project over those years, we had a couple of moments that it could, that we had a total different type of presentation about failure and now it's about success. And, and I, have, I, I kind of point out one thing that says, you know, this was the key to success. I do think it's about the <coughs> perseverance uh, and, and, and 
uh, hard but fair discussions that we had and the belief as well from the customer point of view. Uh, Rinus de Viet who said, um, <coughs> I'm going to get this solution and a supplier is saying, I'm going to provide this solution. And, and I think that the, the quality of the solution provided so much energy that, that this was a success. And that's mainly based on the fact that we asked a different type, type of question. So I do think there's a relationship between that. So, you know, if you want any more details on the project, because we have literally hundreds and thousands of pages of documents, so uh, I can provide at least my information, but also contact Martin, because I do not work here anymore, so if you want to have more details, contact Martin, uh, and also if you want to have more information or just some discussion on... You didn't do this job because of the project. No, 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 actually, I, 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 actually I, no, 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 I, I've, I've made this, uh, I'm, I'm a procurement of innovation consultant, I strongly believe in the positive effects, and I'm willing to bet my livelihood on it, so... Um, if you think this sucks, then yes. <coughs> we spent some time yesterday talking with colleagues about identification of unmet needs. I noticed that was a little, we moved quite quickly. Oh, yeah, we identified <coughs> this need. There was actually a process, a further on process before the need was identified, and also how that process happened. Can you talk, can you remember all that way back and talk a little bit about yeah. how that process happened? Yeah, it's about a year. You know, it's, it's very difficult to say this. Yeah, this, these are the unmet needs. And, and to be sure about the fact that it doesn't have a solution or a, a preferable solution within those unmet needs. Um, so it, the, getting the discussion up to the absolute bottom of what is it that you want and not what you think you need is... is, is, is um, well, sometimes I have the feeling that those discussions in the beginning are quite quickly, but then it has to be more about the details, and then it gets stuck, you know, because then it, uh, yeah, but do I? No, we really want to, really need this in place, right? I mean, what are we going to get? Yes, if you feel that that type of resistance, then you're going the right way, because it's really about getting those walls down. Of, um, uh, for example, we said we need seventy thousand clean beds. We didn't say we need beds to be cleaned 70,000 times. That's a huge difference. So, for example, if it was feasible, we could have ended up with solutions of disposable beds. You know, it's, it's possible within the unmet need. Uh, it's a bit outrageous, but that's something that we really discussed about <coughs> a lot. And I do think those details matter. Other questions? So, um the, the, the ones that you threw out, the ones because manual cleaning, yeah. these, these would have been a service. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, that's what comes through sometimes. Um, I mean, again, the first project, which was the, the, zero waste, the, the zero waste mattress, went from being a product, which then finished up in the waste, to being a service. Yeah. So it's Maybe it's interesting to yeah. tell you as well that <coughs> one of the um, uh, suppliers that uh, was, I think, Harco was at the last. One of the team, was, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> one, he was one of the were parties. The last eight participants in the procedure, but when they decided it had to be mechanical cleaning, so they couldn't um, participate anymore, they actually joined IMS Medical uh, and helped them uh, during the procedure because Aaron got. Uh, 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 Aaron Meijs, the, the well, director of IMS Medical, got involved in the procedure but got quite overwhelmed with it. And Marco Leijen, the commercial director of uh, Hago Zorg, really helped him to uh, uh, finish in the procedure. And we still have a very close relationship with Hago Zorg. Uh, and we now have a, <coughs> a collaboration in which if hospitals want to buy a complete package, that uh, uh, with the service as well, they can do that with us and Hago Zorg together, and they can, can buy a special, we call it Clean Beds on Demand service, and they don't have to worry about anything related to logistics, the, the making up of the beds, everything. So that is something that's quite a, a, a special, we were a competitors, and now we're partners. And it's also possible then, for example, that you just pay the bed, you don't even have to pay yeah. the investment. Yeah. Yeah. So you see different types of business models being implemented to reduce the maybe scary part of buying a machine for 
as an owner. So they lost the procedure, but now they're still uh, with us, and hopefully we can uh, sell the clean on the bets on demand, the demand concept somewhere, because then uh, eventually we do it together. <coughs> Um, well, uh, I think some of you don't know me. I come from Hungary. My name is Bill Balov. I'm coming from the Russian partners in the US. Uh, but I don't quite understand is that how you evaluate different suppliers in the, in the beginning. So you said you, you had eight suppliers yes. and then you reduce it. And uh, how did you do it? Who made the decision? And um, what? Was, was it hard to, to choose suppliers? Um, well, the, I think the most critical evaluation criteria was the fact that we've looked into the, uh, the quality of making the, um, of the capability of the company of making a conceptual idea work in practice. So we really got into those details of are you able to do this? Are you able to provide not only an idea, but are you also able to provide uh, uh, a solution in the end? So no consultancy, but actual conceptual making. So that's really the, the, the type of reference demand that we've made. Um, and that was something IMS Medical had done. Um, so we know they were able of, ah, this is a good idea. And now I'm going to make it. And I, Am I able to sell it? We know they were capable of doing that. Was there also financial support for the company? From our point of view? Um, I don't know, from, from your opinion? Well, I know they had a, they, they, well, I, maybe you know more about that. I know in the beginning they had a small grant for the development of the nozzle you've seen. Uh, but I think they mainly they did, did it on their own personal financing. Yeah. 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 Do you have any? I had uh, already told you earlier, so we did it on, uh, that's why IMS Medical joined with Weber Machinebau and they built a new company, so they have extra funding, because now they are bigger, there are two companies behind it, so that was the first step, and I know they're applying now with uh, one of the suppliers, the robot supplier, together for a grant as well, but uh, <coughs> for Erasmus MC, they finance themselves. That's actually a nice question, because uh, one of my lessons learned in this project as well is not only provide the, the credible and genuine demand for the solution or the unmet need, but it's also supplying uh, those SMEs with information about government grants and information about experimenting um, grants. We have a lot of um, what's the name? We have a lot of um, test gardens, uh, we call them, uh, which are like you can, if you have an innovative uh, lamppost, you can put it in the ground somewhere here in Rotterdam and you can see how it works. Just provide them with those type of information so they can uh, see if the risk of putting in a tender is being reduced from their point of view. So it's, it's, a, it's actually a good question, yeah. And it's also a question for me if there is a technical risk in <coughs> someone. So Sorry, technical risk in? Uh, in uh, an innovation risk that's, you know, that the, you need a technical solution that in the end uh, the supplier doesn't find. That yes, one. So true. And I do believe that if we're going to do this type of projects on a broader scale, that we're going to end up with numbers that 25%, I have no idea, are going to fail. But then again, if you know that um, the money spent by the government in research and development, the, the ratio of the, the money spent and the actual outcome is also something about 25% effective. But that 25% is so effective that it, it works for the economy. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, just, 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 hold on, Gator. Just to follow up on that point, so, sorry. if you could talk a little bit about the two-phase contract. Yeah. Um, so you said that... I will do. Um, uh, keep, keep, just okay. hold on to your... Please. Yeah, I have a question regarding the selection procedure. The, the what? The, the selection procedure. Selection procedure, yeah. Um, you have requested uh, one reference to be submitted um, together with a proposal <coughs> or as part of the proposal. Um, and now, later on, you said, okay, we were particularly interested in uh, seeing that the that the bidder could convince you yeah. that they were able to move from here yes. year to, yeah. say, to, to the solution. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of 
evidence or documentation did you request or what did you get on the table when, when you did that, uh, that um, procedure? Um, well, enough. So, uh, well, it's a bit, it's a, uh, because we had such a wide demand, we had such a wide demand in, uh, we didn't say it has to be in this market or in this branch, it, it has to be about providing an uh, idea and then also implementing the solution. Yeah. Um, so but something seemed seem to be more convincing than something else. Sorry? I mean, some, some documents or some, some uh, yes, documents true. seem to be yeah. more convincing than, uh, than mm -hmm. other uh, uh, arguments. Yes, but uh, also bear in mind that for us, the selection phase was not really to reduce. It actually was to uh, widen. Uh, because we only had one supplier and we really wanted a lot of suppliers to participate in the competitive dialogue because that's the phase when you're actually going to talk about the yeah. solutions on itself. Uh, and I think that's a more effective phase uh, than just seeing if somebody has a reference. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we did want something because we cannot uh, take up 20 suppliers in the competitive dialogue. I mean, it takes up way too much time and way too much money for the process itself. Um, so that this this was the compromise that we came up with, and we didn't evaluate very harsh. Didn't, if, it, if, if it suited the demand, we said, okay, please participate in the dialogue. So, so how long did the dialogue take, and, and uh, what sort of, uh, say, legal counseling did you have uh, during the dialogue? Uh, legal counseling was done internally. And what, what, what were the issues? Uh, not too much, really. We didn't encounter a lot of issues. Well, the main issue was getting from A to three. That was a that was a legal nightmare. Yeah, from the we had five hand cleaning participants, oh, right. yeah. and, and we didn't. And we just had unmet need, and all of a sudden we have a demand that it has to be made by a machine. Mm -hmm. So you know that's a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you know we say ah, every, everything is possible except if it's cl cleaning by hand. You know that's not really something that was. Mm -hmm. Um, so it didn't appear from the tinder documents that you were looking for a machine and not for no. a solution. No, well, yeah. eventually <coughs> it, it happened. I think somewhere um, the dialogue started in June and we ended in December. Um, so it was a good half year, seven months, I guess. Uh, I think somewhere in the summer uh, we had this discussion on uh, manual cleaning or cleaning by machine. <coughs> and then we ended up with losing the discussion. So actually, uh, this could have taken a lot longer, but we only had three left, or two, to be honest. Um, so, you know, we can do more frequent talks. Yes, I, I jump to the present, and they say, uh, you, you have started, I asked, like, uh, Gainer told me in November, eh, mm -hmm. to have the machines. Yeah. Now, according to which criteria do you measure the performance of the system? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, for how long will you, uh, are you planning to measure? That. To measure uh, even for further pro uh, improvements or whatever? Yeah, and uh, are you considering also the personnel needs for maneuvering the machines, etc.? Because uh, now, with the cut of all the expenses in the health system, at least in my country, uh, they are reducing the personnel terribly. So, these are my, my curiosities. Mm -hmm. my yep, yep, that's now, I can tell you something about that. Um, uh, firstly, the measurements. Uh, we provide Anya uh, every month with all kind of management information, but mainly about um, performance. Uh, what which one? Uh, performance. Like the mice then. Yeah, so uh, <coughs> performance, uh, if there is a default, uh, why is there uh, a default? Is there an um, interruption because of a machine break, breakdown or is there a user failure? There are a lot of user failures still because um, there are a lot of people working at her department and they're all different. They were used to cleaning manually, <coughs> and now they have to operate a machine. It's a different kind of work. So, so we provide um, Elsmus MC every month with a report on that, and we evaluate that every month now. Uh, furthermore, we um, provide them with some information about consumption. 
A part of the consumption is easy. We can, like the water consumption, we measure it daily, every every wash cycle. We measure it, so she gets a, a report of that as well. Other consumptions, we t uh, test more uh, once in two, three months. And now they were consistent, so like the electricity and the uh, air consumption, we've tested on several occasions, and now we've agreed because it's consistent that within a year, of, yeah, I think the, 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 the first maintenance cycle or next year will be the first moment to measure it again. So that's uh, uh, the kind of type of measuring on hygiene aspects, uh, the, the cleaning uh, aspects. We've, din we've done a lot of testing during the delivering the machine. We, we delivered the machine, it was working, and then we did a week of testing on hygiene aspects. Mm -hmm. And that was consistent, so no uh, other measurements on hygienic uh, aspects have been done since then, but we have still uh, plan planning to talk to the microbiology professor here to make new uh, agreements about that, because I can imagine that they want to know within a year if it's still consistent with the test results at delivery the machine. Right, thank you very much, both of you. Can we thank both speakers again, please? For very detailed, very honest presentations um, have given us a complete picture. And full of enthusiasm. Full of enthusiasm, and, and we've, we've, some of us in Equip have followed this along the way. We've seen bits of the journey here and there. We've had, as you said, a 10 minute presentation or a 15 minute presentation, but it was great to see the this from both sides, customer, supplier, all the steps in between, all the changes in personnel, all the difficulties and challenges, but also, as you put it, the, um, the pot of gold at the end. Uh, it's a, uh, quite an inspirational story.